Hi, welcome to Healthy Living. I'm Stacy Young, the Director of Customer Service at Western Baptist Hospital. We're excited today to have with us Dr. Joseph Ashburn. He is the Director of the Nationally Certified Stroke Center at Western Baptist. Dr. Ashburn, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, the topic that we have on hand is stroke and really such an important topic that we often perhaps don't spend enough time on. I was, I was doing some research today and saw that stroke is the leading cause of long-term disability in the United States and the third leading cause of death. So can you help us out and share with us really what is a stroke? Absolutely, well, well thanks for having me first of all. And uh, you know a stroke, it's interesting, a lot of times it's misunderstood and uh, we, we did a survey once to find out uh, where people thought a stroke was and you know some people said it was in the heart and some people in the belly and uh, you know we got a lot of fun answers but the truth of it is, is a stroke happens in the brain and there's two main types uh, the most common type is when an artery going to one part of the brain becomes clotted or clogged so that uh, there is a lack of blood flow going to that section of the brain and that happens about 85 percent of the time uh, a more rare form of stroke, 15% 15, 15 of the time, uh, is the opposite, where there's too much blood going to a region or a blood vessel ruptures, and that's called a hemorrhagic stroke. So that's, that's theoretically what a stroke is. Um, you know, stroke oftentimes is misunderstood because unlike a heart attack or, uh, you know, some other medical diagnoses, there's such a variety of symptoms that it can present with, mm -hmm. as opposed to just chest pain, we see uh, so many different uh, signs and symptoms that can be consistent with a, a new stroke. Mm -hmm. Well, and so understanding those signs and symptoms are very important. Before we touch on that though, I know people here often, uh, they had a mini stroke, mm -hmm. or a TIA is a word that uh, you hear from doctors and from patients. How is that different than uh, a normal stroke, if you will? That's a great question, and, and in all honesty, uh, there, there's been a lot of debate about that. Uh, and it's so important to get those two, uh, you know, differentiated and figure out which one's which. So whenever a blood clot lands in a blood vessel and there's a lack of blood flow going to the brain, uh, there, there are chemicals in our body that actually start breaking down that clot. And sometimes they're successful. And when they're successful, then the clot dissolves and blood flow is returned to that region. So the symptoms that began at the onset of the soon-to-be stroke mm -hmm. resolve. And so we call that a transient, meaning doesn't last, uh, ischemic, which means lack of blood flow attack. And of course, that's abbreviated TIA. Mm -hmm. Some people call that a mini stroke, and, and that's an acceptable term to call it. Uh, the problem with that is, is that oftentimes if you tell a patient you've had a mini stroke, then they go to the next doctor and that becomes I've had a stroke. And there's a big difference in those because a stroke is the opposite, which means a blood clot has formed and there's no blood flow going to that section of the brain, but the clot doesn't dissolve. It stays around long enough to the brain tissue distal to the clot, so past the clot. Uh, does not come back and so there isn't a restoration of blood flow, so those symptoms last in the patient. Normally, uh, what has been decided as a lasting symptom and what is not a lasting symptom is 24 hours. So a symptom that comes on and goes away within 24 hours is considered a TIA or that mini stroke designation. Mm -hmm. uh, anything that lasts over 24 hours is actually called a stroke. Now, there's been some recent debate now where a lot of doctors are coming on board and saying, well, you know, most mini strokes or TIAs last less than an hour and oftentimes only last minutes. And so some people think that we should actually take that down to maybe 15 minutes or an hour. But for right now, it's any symptom that lasts less than, than, uh, than 24 hours. Another thought, and I don't know if this is going to happen or not eventually, is that if we get an MRI, no matter when we get that MRI, if the MRI is positive for any kind of ischemic damage or a lack of blood flow, that that's also considered a stroke. And what we worry about between the two is the stroke might actually have lasting deficits, such as an inability to swallow, which we would need to test for before we just start giving that patient food or water, or the inability to move your arm or speech mm -hmm. deficits. Okay. So these symptoms um, can be the same for either type. What are the most common symptoms of a stroke? Well, uh, you know, if, if you looked up symptoms of a stroke uh, on the internet, you might find pages of uh, different presentations and things that people said, well, I came in with this symptom and that symptom and it ended up being a stroke. The mnemonic that we try to 
push out to the public is FAST, F-A-S-T. Mm -hmm. and, and that's probably the most common symptoms of a stroke. F stands for face. So often what happens is, is that you'll look at someone and you'll see that one side of their face is droopy. And if you ever look at someone and you wonder if that's the case, you can ask them to smile. And when they smile, you should actually see both sides of their lips turn upward. That's, that's a normal smile. Right. But if one side turns upward and the other one doesn't, then that means it's asymmetric. One side doesn't look like another. And so that would be positive for the F in fast face. A is arm. So normally with a stroke, one side gets weak. Now it can be arm and leg, but the mnemonics just kind of lends itself right. to, to referencing the arm. And so what we often see is someone's arm gets weak. And that can be anything from not being able to move it at all, or maybe, for instance, in somebody who was right-handed that had a very strong arm, mm -hmm. it might be where it's just a little bit weak, but they can still lift it. Mm -hmm. Or even they can lift it, and it doesn't seem weak initially, but when they go to grab something, they miss it, or there's a lack of coordination. Mm -hmm. That's the A in FAST. S stands for speech. And so if you're speaking to someone and, and it doesn't make sense, for instance, they're using the wrong words or, or they're just missing the word a little bit. So if you hand them a pencil and they call it a pen, or if you show them a watch and they call it a clock, that that's, means their speech is off and that could be a sign of a stroke. Mm -hmm. Or some people call it garbled speech. It's actually called dysarthria, uh, where when you talk to someone, their words make sense but it sounds like that they have cotton in their mouth or they just got back from the dentist. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's a dysarthria, so that could also be a sign of a stroke. And then the T in FAST, F-A-S-T, stands for time. And we can talk about that in a little more detail in a minute, but basically, if you see any of those symptoms, mm -hmm. you shouldn't wait. And, and I gotta tell you, that's the most common thing I hear, which is, I've had one of these symptoms, but I thought I would just go to bed and see if it would go away, or if I just waited long enough, I think it would resolve. And that's the worst thing you can do. So that T stands for time, which is mm -hmm. call 911 or, or get on the phone and, and call a loved one and have them come over and, and get you and take you straight to a hospital. Okay. And so, and oftentimes I've heard patients uh, say when we talk about speech, mm -hmm. I'm not thinking right. Sure. Um, the, the patient would say, I, I don't understand, I, I can't get it out. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And so family members, really or it's okay for me to assess you mm -hmm. uh, at least in terms of seeking emergency medical care is this something you need to go to the ER for absolutely so you know the the thing about it is is that there are a variety of causes of confusion uh, mm -hmm. you know specifically as we age our brain becomes uh, less good at getting around things like pneumonias, urinary tract infections, uh, even being just really sleepy can cause you to be confused. Right. And, and uh, often it's difficult to tell whether someone is confused or whether their speech is truly messed up, whether it mm -hmm. be slurred uh, or whether it have the word finding difficulties I was just describing. Right. So I anytime I think that you see a loved one or, or a loved one calls you and, and they don't make sense, uh, I think there's enough uh, concern there that you probably should call 911 or get that person to the, the emergency department immediately. Okay, great. So you mentioned time um, and, and so important because there's some medications out there, there are some interventions available if people do act fast. Can you talk with us about that? Absolutely. So this is probably where stroke makes its, uh, its, its greatest press and people get the most excited about it. There's a medicine out there called TPA, and uh, some people reference it as the miracle drug. Uh, it's got a lot of names. Mm -hmm. I gotta say that, that we as doctors get excited about it, but we didn't come up with it. We stole the idea from the body itself. We all have this drug in our body, and we just figured out a synthetic way of making it. It's a clot-busting medicine. So just as I told you that a stroke is caused by a clot that mm -hmm. jams in a vessel, and that we hope that the body breaks it up itself, I can give extra amounts of that medicine to break up that clot. Now the problem is, is that when the clot jams, the blood vessel that's past that clot uh, doesn't have blood as well. So in addition to the brain becoming weaker and weaker behind the clot, the, the vessel itself is as well. So if I were to break up the clot hours after the stroke happened, we would be in danger of the vessel wall no longer holding the blood in once I released the blood pressure back. Mm -hmm. And so if I give the clot busting medicine, uh, we think that we can reverse some of the deficits potentially. Uh, 
uh, by restoring blood flow to the region. And in the first three hours, we think that works reasonably well. Anything after three hours, the fear that we have is if we were to break up that clot, that the blood vessel wall would no longer have the integrity to hold the blood pressure. Mm -hmm. And so we run the risk of causing a bleed. So we go from one type of stroke, the ischemic type, where there's no blood flow, to having the opposite problem mm -hmm. where there's too much blood and the blood's going places it shouldn't be. So the TPA uh, is a drug that we, we use anytime someone comes in within the first three hours, we can give them this drug and potentially reverse the symptoms of stroke, or if nothing else, we can make them better. And, and I think it's important for me to clarify exactly what we expect TPA to do. You would think that if I were to give the drugs that instantly the clot would break loose and the symptoms would resolve in front of your eyes. Mm -hmm. and, and I'd be lying to you if I didn't tell you that I've had that happen numerous times and, and there's nothing better. The family's excited, I'm excited, the patient's excited. But in the studies in which approved TPA for use, what they found is, is that in the first 24 hours there wasn't a significant difference in the people who got TPA and who didn't. They all got better or did not get better the exact same. But three months out, if you took those people that got TPA versus the ones who didn't, the people that got TPA were 30% 30 30 more likely to be walking around, mm. living their life as they were before the stroke and so forth like that, versus the people who didn't. So anybody who can come in with a stroke in that first three hours and I give them this medicine, that increases their likelihood by 30% of them returning back to a baseline mm -hmm. uh, status where they're living their lives just as they were. And that's a fantastic, I mean, just absolutely tremendous drug that will allow you to do that. Now, the even more exciting part about that is that three hours has been you know, cited for years and years saying, well, that's how long we can give the drug. But there's new studies coming out now that's saying that maybe even out to four and a half hours, we can give that drug. So it may be that if you come into our emergency department next year or the next, that we start giving that drug even further and further out. Right. And if I can't give you that drug, there's even more uh, opportunities to potentially reverse a stroke. Uh, there are things like catheterizations where we can put a wire up next to the clot and even push the drug right next to the clot. Uh, we can put a little corkscrew mechanism in the clot and pull it out. We can actually put a suction cup device directly on the clot and pull back and see if we can remove the clot that way. So what I would encourage people to do is come in as quickly as possible. But if you find your loved one uh, or your friend or colleague and you think they've had a stroke and you're not sure how long that stroke has been occurring for, don't hesitate to bring them in. Just because it's been longer than three hours, don't let that stop you. Come on in because just because they're outside of the three hour mark, there's still things we can do. Absolutely, and, and we want people to understand that three hour mark is not when you get to the hospital, it's from the onset of, a sim of symptoms. That's a great point. So uh, as soon as somebody is, is seen normal that last time, mm -hmm. that's the start of that clock. So if someone goes to bed, for instance, at 10 p.m. and they woke, wake up with a stroke at 6 a.m., then I have to use that 10 p.m. time the night before as when the stroke could have started because they could have had a stroke just minutes after they went to sleep. So, yeah, that, that's a really good point. Okay, good. Thank you so much for that. So we see a lot of stroke patients in our region, and as a neurologist, um, you've got a pretty busy practice with victims of stroke. Why is, that, is, is there a higher prevalence of stroke in our region and why would that be? Absolutely there are. Uh, you know there was this really interesting study done uh, several years back that identified uh, this belt of states if you would uh, mm -hmm. that, that's kind of on the uh, you know the so-called Mason-Dixon line where in these states not only was stroke more prevalent but when people had strokes they just inherently did worse. Uh, and so they were more severe strokes, there was more of them and so forth. Kentucky wasn't in the, that initial uh, stroke belt as it has now been called, mm -hmm. but since that time the stroke belt has been expanded to include us. And, and so Kentucky, if you compare it to some of the more northern states or maybe the southwestern portions of the United States, actually does have a higher prevalence of stroke and we're even were even suggested to have a higher mortality or morbidity of stroke when it does occur. There are probably a number of reasons. Uh, you know, there may be some genetic risk factors. Maybe the population itself are just genetically prone to having strokes. But I think lifestyle probably has a little bit to do with it as well. 
Uh, things like smoking, I think in our region you can safely say that the greater than average uh, portion of the population uh, use tobacco and that's a huge stroke risk factor. In fact, it doubles your risk of stroke. Uh, obesity, high blood pressure, diabetes, uh, sedentary lifestyle, all of those things are lifestyle characteristics uh, that increase your chance of having a stroke and maybe uh, that they're increased in our population compared with other states. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, being in the South, um, our diets, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, who doesn't like a good piece of fried chicken? Absolutely. But uh, diet plays a role, obviously, not just obesity, but, but what we're consuming, those high fat foods. Is that correct? That, that is correct. Absolutely. Uh, you know, obesity, high blood sugar, which of course, you know, diabetes itself is probably a little bit to do with our diet. Mm -hmm. uh, but yes, uh, high cholesterol foods and, you know, just high cholesterol in general uh, are all risk factors for stroke. And, uh, you know, I think that in Kentucky, and I'm as guilty as anybody, we just can't help ourselves when it comes to fried food. And, uh, you know, they're maybe not always the best choice for us as far as, uh, you know, heart and brain health. Certainly. And certainly something, something to think about if you have other risk factors, changing your diet is, is an easy way to do that. Absolutely. So um, talking more about thinking in our area about stroke, not only do we talk about risk factors uh, in terms of our bodies, but what about family history? Does that ever play a role in that? That's absolutely the case. So, you know, when it comes to stroke, we like to identify risk factors as being, uh, you know, modifiable risk factors and those that aren't. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that makes pretty good sense in the sense that there are genetic predispositions to having stroke. So if your father, mother, grandparents, you know, close relatives had stroke, heart disease, or clotting disorders at an early age, say before the age of 40, then you yourself might be at increased risk for stroke. The, the thing about that is, is there's nothing you can do about it. Your genes are your genes. There's mm -hmm. nothing we can do about it yet, of course. But, uh, you know, you shouldn't stop there because if that is the case, you know, if there is a genetic predisposition to you having stroke, that's even more reason to be proactive in your lifestyle and things, look at things like diet, uh, diet modifications, lifestyle modifications, smoking cessation, things like that. So mm -hmm. if you know you're at risk, you can start making those changes earlier in your life so that you decrease your overall risk of having strokes and heart disease. Absolutely. Now, if you've had one stroke, are you more likely to have another? What a great question. L let me change it around a little bit, if you don't mind. <laughs> Not at all. So, so yes, having a stroke itself, your, uh, you know, itself is a risk factor for having another stroke. But let me back up and probably deliver even a more important message: is TIAs. You know, these darn mini strokes that we talked about a few mm -hmm. minutes ago. A lot of people think that since the deficits, the the fact that your arm weakness or speech symptoms went away, that you're done that, okay, well, it's gone and, and I'm back to normal, I shouldn't worry about it. But in all reality, the greatest risk of stroke comes directly after having a TIA. It, it's almost a warning symptom, if you will, because once again, it's, it's the idea that a clot lodged and then it broke itself up, but wherever that clot came from is still there, whether that be your heart or neck vessels or the vessel itself in your brain that the mm -hmm. clot formed on you are increased risk for a stroke and in the first three days you're at the greatest risk and then in the, the next 30 days you're still at an increased risk. So the nice thing about having a stroke center uh, like the one that I work at is is we, we are very proactive when it comes to that sort of thing. So if you come into our stroke center and you've had what we think is a TI or mini stroke, we're going to bring you into the hospital, try to find out what caused that TI or mini stroke and reverse it or in increase your chances of not having that stroke that hopefully, you know, that may have been coming your way. And the numbers uh, is kind of a numbers game, of course, right. is that we can find that in 70% of patients. Wow. So if you come in and you've had a TIA, there's a 70% chance we can figure out what caused it and we can lower your risk of having a stroke. That's great news, mm -hmm. great news. Now, I do want to touch on uh, just a moment Victims of stroke mm -hmm. um, sometimes have very debilitating um, health effects from the stroke. Sure. Can we talk just a little bit about that and, and what that looks like for people? You know, you talked about swallowing. Mm -hmm. um, what other long-term problems do people face who've had really bad strokes? Absolutely. So the complications of the strokes uh, of strokes are are huge. Mm -hmm. 
And it's easiest to divide them into two different categories, which is acute. Acute means within the first couple of days or a week to the chronic complications that probably most people are familiar with because everyone's seen a chronic stroke victim. The acute stroke uh, complications would include things like your swallowing mechanism sometimes gets damaged by the stroke. And that's not something you can see. You know, you can see if someone's face is drooping, you can see if someone's arm's weak, but there's no way I could look at you and say, well, I bet you can't swallow. Right. So part of the certification of becoming a stroke center is to be aware of things like that. So when someone comes in and we think they might have had a stroke, before we even give them a drink of water, before we even put a pill down their throat or anything like that, we can check things like that and screen for them. Uh, so swallowing complications easily be something we look for after a stroke. And without that screening, the very first time you, you fed the patient or, or gave them a drink of water, it would go down to their lungs and cause a possible aspiration pneumonia or a pneumonitis, which means it just went down the wrong tube and you couldn't cough it back up. Mm -hmm. and, and that can be a deadly complication of a stroke. Pr another uh, acute complication is in very large strokes, you can actually get brain swelling. And brain swelling itself can be deadly if not reversed. And so in the first couple of days after a stroke, uh, just like if you were to hit your arm and then it would swell up the next couple of days. In a stroke itself, this damages the brain, it does swell for a couple of days. And there's some things we can do for that, so mm -hmm. we have to look out for that as well. And believe it or not, an MI, so a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, is one of the leading killers right after a stroke. So you can have a stroke and come in for that, but we have to watch your heart for the next couple of days because you can actually have an ischemic event in your heart from the stroke itself. Mm -hmm. So those are just some of the acute uh, complications and maybe even some blood clots in your legs, urinary tract infections, all those things are common and things that we look out for in, in the hospital setting right after a stroke occurs. Now the long-term complications are really probably what the family deals with and the friends and the support mechanisms of the patients. Their deficits, uh, whether they be paralyzed on one side, uh, you know, whether they have difficulties uh, with swallowing, all those things can last for months if not years. And so it may be that the patient is confined to a wheelchair, maybe they were living home independently ahead of time, but now they're either in a wheelchair at home with a modified sink and shower and so forth like that, mm -hmm. or maybe they would be forced to go to a nursing facility. And you know, you mentioned at the beginning of our broadcast that stroke was the leading cause of disability nationwide, and, and this is exactly what we're getting into here, is the mm -hmm. deficits that came on at the onset of the stroke, some of them resolve, but some of them stay around. Depression is actually one of the most common uh, complications of a stroke long term. Mm -hmm. and, and what we see with depression is, is it's probably a chemical imbalance in the brain, although we can't prove this, that's mm -hmm. caused by the stroke. And it's a huge barrier to rehab and to reintegrate into society and into our family. You know, after a stroke, you can do physical therapy, occupational therapy, and regain some of the strength that you lost or some of the problems that you have. You can regain some function. Mm -hmm. But a depressed person won't do that. They want to lay in bed or just sit there, and they don't want to engage themselves. And so they stand very little of a chance to uh, return back to their baseline or at least to improve. So as a stroke physician, after I discharge somebody from the hospital, that's one of the things I'm looking you know, the most for is things like depression or some of these long-term complications. Okay, okay, something for us to think about. Um, you know, I, I shared with you before the show even, I think that's a big motivator to think about long-term uh, what we have to deal with. Uh, and some of that is preventable, mm -hmm. as you mentioned. So looking over some of the statistics um, that we know through national studies, um, interesting to me, each year about 46,000 more women than men have a stroke. That's right. Uh, you know, just briefly, can you talk to us about what do women need to be on the lookout for? Do they have the same symptoms? What's going on there? Absolutely. You know, uh, breast cancer, it's breast cancer month this month, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and so you see pink everywhere. And, uh, and of course, I'm biased. I'm a stroke doctor. But uh, a lot of people don't realize that stroke kills three times as many women than breast cancer. Wow. And, and so, uh, you know, women are just as susceptible, you know, at, at, to stroke as men are. As you point out, you know, th there's just alarming statistics. But what I would have to say to you is that in all reality, there are some things in, in younger women that might surprise you that are stroke risk factors. So oral contraceptive pills, for instance, birth control pills, mm -hmm. uh, increase your chance of clotting. And when combined with smoking can be very dangerous. Mm -hmm. uh, and then also there are some autoimmune diseases uh, that can 
hit young females that would increase their chance of, uh, of stroke. And things like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, uh, which I think some women would become familiar with because they have difficulties, you know, uh, carrying pregnancies and so forth. So it's not uncommon to actually see, uh, you know, some young females reporting with stroke-like symptoms and it really be a stroke. Uh, and then, you know, a as women age, there are hormonal ch changes as well. Uh, and hormones play a huge risk factor in stroke. You know, uh, we think at, at some point they are protective, but then, uh, you know, once a female goes through menopause, then those protective mechanisms are kind of withdrawn. And then mm -hmm. there's kind of this, if you were at increased risk for stroke, maybe you were protected, uh, you know, throughout middle age, but then as you enter, uh, you know, postmenopausal state, you're at increased risk for stroke, and we see, a, you know, a huge increase. Uh, in right. that. And there's a lot of studies now pointed towards women in stroke, and there's been a lot of findings recently. Mm -hmm. So the important message is don't ignore those symptoms. Uh, yeah, they're plastered everywhere. That's right. And, uh, you know, women, I, I know, typically try to be the tough ones and That's right. take care of the family, but don't walk away from uh, any of those telltale signs. Absolutely. Time is brain. Mm -hmm. So when in doubt, present early. If, if you don't understand what's going on, that's a great time to, to call the ambulance, go into your nearest emergency department, and let us check you out. Okay, good. Some very good advice there. Really a, a tough subject, but one that we need to continue to bring to the attention of the public because uh, we can certainly reduce long-term injury um, and perhaps bring people back. I know uh, you've had great success with full recoveries from patients who've come in in a timely manner. So we certainly don't want to walk away from, uh, from that, that three-hour window mm -hmm. from the onset of symptoms. Sure, and every minute counts. Okay. So, so don't wait for three hours. Yes, and really, you know, calling for an ambulance uh, gets you here safely, gets you here fast. So we want to we continue to focus on that. Absolutely. Uh, I can't thank you enough for your efforts in stroke education uh, here and at, at the Nationally Certified Stroke Center at Western Baptist. Just as a reminder to uh, the public today, act fast, which is face, arm, speech, and time. Uh, with Dr. Ashburn today, uh, we are so glad to have you on Healthy Living. We hope that you will join us next time. Uh, have a great day. Thank you.